Moving on, let's now look at the cell and the different minutest components that make its existence possible. The characteristics of substances are made depend on the way their atoms are linked together in groups to form molecules. Therefore, in order to understand how living organisms are built from inanimate matter, it is crucial to know how all of the chemical bonds that hold atoms together in molecules are formed. Just think about it, we can only marvel at the miracle, of how inorganic and lifeless atoms can join together and form molecules. Molecules to macromolecules. Macromolecules to organelles and cells. Cells to tissues. Tissues to organ systems and finally to a living, breathing organism such as man. This section will now explore how such chemical components, atoms, and molecules, can eventually form a living organism. All living cells are composed of a set of elements. They are around 92 naturally occurring elements, but in biological organisms, there are only a number of elements that play important roles. The major constituents of most biomolecules, comprising 96.5% of all the atoms in an organism, are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element comprising almost 50% of all the atoms in a biological organism. Carbon and oxygen atoms come next, each making almost 25% of all atoms. Nitrogen comes a far fourth. Other elements, though minute in amount, play crucial roles in biochemical processes. Phosphate is a component of nucleic acids. Calcium plays a key role in innumerable biologic processes. Other constituents include iron, iodine, potassium, sodium chloride, and magnesium and they are usually encountered, in clinical practice in patients with various diseases. I've mentioned at the start of this lecture that we have to go down to, not only the molecular, even atomic level, but deeper even to the subatomic level. Just bear with me, everything will make sense in due time. It may not come as a surprise, but we all know that cells are just made up of a few types of atoms. What is an atom? The illustration shown here is representative of the atom. As we may remember, each atom has at its center a positively charged nucleus, which is surrounded at some distance by a cloud of negatively charged electrons. These electrons are held in a series of orbitals, by electrostatic attraction to the nucleus. The nucleus, in turn, consists of two kinds of subatomic particles, first, protons, which are positively charged, and secondly, neutrons, which are electrically neutral. To understand how atoms bond together to form the molecules that make up living organisms, we have to pay special attention to their electrons. In living tissues, it is only the electrons of an atom that undergo rearrangements. They form the exterior of an atom and specify the rules of chemistry by which atoms combine to form molecules. Other atoms found in living tissues all have incomplete outer electron shells and are therefore, able to donate, accept, or share electrons with each other to form both molecules and ions. Can you recall what the atomic number means? What is its importance? The atomic number, also known as the proton number, of a chemical element, is defined as the number of protons found in the nucleus of every atom of that element. More importantly, the atomic number uniquely identifies a chemical element. It is identical to the charge number of the nucleus. Thus, in an uncharged atom, we can also say, that the atomic number is also equal to the number of electrons. As shown, the atom on the left has an atomic number of 6. This means, therefore, that this particular atom has 6 protons in its nucleus. And if it is uncharged or is not an ion, it will also have the same corresponding number of electrons. In this case, 6 electrons as well. The atom on the right, on the other hand, represents the smallest atom. It has an atomic number of 1, thus it possesses only 1 proton and consequently if uncharged, only one electron, as well. This atom, hydrogen, is special because it does not possess any neutron. As an aside, one very useful tool in studying the different elements, their structure and properties, as a function of their atomic number is this website, the dynamic periodic table found at www.ptable.com. Feel free to browse and play with this dynamic table in your most convenient time. All living cells are composed of a set of elements. The major constituents of most biomolecules are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. The most abundant substance of the living cell is water, which accounts for about 70% of a cell's weight. As we all know, most intracellular reactions occur in the aqueous environment. Consequently, the interactions between water and the other constituents of cells are of central importance in biological chemistry. 
There are 92 naturally occurring elements, each differing from the others in the number of protons and electrons in its atoms. Living organisms, however, are made of only a small selection of these elements, four of which are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, that make up 96.5% of an organism's weight. Please do take note of the atomic numbers of these four very important atoms. This composition in living organisms differs markedly from that of the non-living inorganic environment, and is evidence of a distinctive type of chemistry. The most common elements in living organisms are listed in this table with some of their atomic characteristics. Let's now look at electronic orbitals. Electronic orbitals are regions within the atom, in which electrons have the highest probability of being found. The number of electrons in the outermost shell of a particular atom determines its reactivity, or tendency to form chemical bonds with other atoms. This outermost shell is known as the valence shell, and the electrons found in it are called valence electrons. In general, atoms are most stable and least reactive, when their outermost electron shell is full. Most of the elements important in biology, need 8 electrons in their outermost shell in order to be stable. This rule of thumb is known as the octet rule. Some atoms can be stable with an octet even though their valence shell is the 3n shell, which can hold up to 18 electrons. To continue, atoms, like other things governed by the laws of physics, tend to take on the lowest energy, most stable configuration they can. Thus, the electron shells of an atom are populated from the inside out, with electrons filling up the low-energy shells closer to the nucleus, before they move into the higher-energy shells further out. The shell closest to the nucleus, 1n, can hold 2 electrons, while the next shell, 2n, can hold 8, and the third shell, 3n, can hold up to 18. Again, remember the octet rule, which we previously discussed. All the elements commonly found in living organisms have unfilled outermost shells, with the electrons shown in red, and can thus participate in chemical reactions with other atoms. For comparison, some elements that have only filled shells, shown here in yellow. These atoms are chemically unreactive, and are known as the inert elements. So naturally, there will be a lot of atoms with incomplete electron shells. Because an unfilled electron shell is less stable than a filled one, Atoms with incomplete outer shells have a strong tendency to interact with other atoms, in a way that causes them to either gain, or lose enough electrons to achieve a completed outermost shell. This electron exchange can be achieved, either by transferring electrons from one atom to another, or by sharing electrons between two atoms. To continue, atoms can attain a more stable arrangement of electrons in their outermost shell, by interacting with one another in order to achieve a complete outermost electron shell remember the octet rule. This interaction between atoms can involve a transfer or one or more electrons from one atom to another. This will lead to the formation of an ionic or electrostatic bond. On the other hand, electrons can be shared between two atoms which will lead to the formation of a covalent bond. In chemistry, the valence or valency of an element is a measure of its combining power with other atoms, when it forms chemical compounds or molecules. Simply stated, Valency refers to the number of electrons that an atom must acquire or lose to attain a filled outer shell. To have a clearer understanding of the different types of chemical bonds, let us illustrate the differences between an ionic and covalent bond. What is shown on the left, is an ionic bond that is formed when electrons are transferred from one atom to the other. We will look deeper into this in the succeeding slides when we discuss the different non-covalent bonds. On the other hand, a covalent bond is formed when electrons are shared between atoms. We will look into a specific example of covalent bonds within a particular molecule in the next slide. To continue, what is shown here is a molecule of methane or CH4. The illustration shows the completion of the outer electron shells of the atoms of hydrogen and carbon. Please take note that with electron sharing, all four hydrogen atoms have complete electron shells with two electrons. On the other hand, carbon, with atomic number 6, has only four electrons in its outermost orbital. Therefore, it needs four more electrons to satisfy the octet rule. In order for carbon to achieve a filled electron shell of eight electrons, each atom of hydrogen will have to share its lone electron. Thus, carbon will form covalent bonds with four atoms of hydrogen. A nonpolar covalent bond is a type of chemical bond that is formed when electrons are shared equally between two atoms. This is termed as nonpolar, because the difference in electronegativity is mostly negligible. And this type of covalent bond happens when the two atoms in the bond are either of the same atom, or of different atoms with a slight difference in electronegativities. To recall, electronegativity is a chemical property that describes the tendency of an atom, 
or a functional group to attract electrons towards itself, and thus has the tendency to form a partially negative end or pole. In addition, the nonpolar covalent bond existing between two different atoms, is exemplified by the bond between carbon and hydrogen. Both the carbon and hydrogen atoms have similar electronegativities, and thus attract the shared electrons almost equally. On the other hand, when the atoms joined by a covalent bond belong to those with dissimilar electronegativities, the two atoms usually attract the shared electrons to different degrees giving rise to a polar group or molecule. By definition, a polar structure, in the electrical sense is one with positive charge concentrated toward one end, that is, the positive pole, a negative charge concentrated toward the other, or the negative pole. Compared with a carbon atom, for example, oxygen and nitrogen atoms attract electrons relatively strongly, whereas a hydrogen atom attracts electrons more weakly. Covalent bonds in which the electrons are shared unequally in this way are therefore known as polar covalent bonds. The best examples of polar covalent bonds are the bonds between oxygen and hydrogen, and between nitrogen and hydrogen. A further crucial property of any bond, covalent or noncovalent, is its strength. Bond strength is measured by the amount of energy that must be supplied to break that bond. This is often expressed in units of kilocalories per mole or in kilojoules per mole. Typical covalent bonds are stronger than non-covalent bonds. The making and breaking of covalent bonds are violent events, and in living cells, they are carefully controlled by highly specific catalysts, called enzymes. On the other hand, noncovalent bonds, as a rule, are much weaker. We shall see later that they are important in the cell in the many situations where molecules have to associate, and dissociate readily to carry out their functions. In molecular geometry, bond length or bond distance is defined as the average distance between nuclei of two bonded atoms in a molecule. It is a transferable property of a bond between atoms of fixed types, relatively independent of the rest of the molecule. In stable molecules, the attractive and repulsive forces are in balance, and thus bond lengths are therefore dependent on the bond strength, which is influenced by the number of bonds between the atoms. Bond lengths are measured in picometers. A picometer is a unit of length in the metric system, equal to one trillionth of a meter. As we can see here, the greater the number of bonds between atoms, for example, in molecules with double or triple bonds, the stronger their bond strength is, and consequently the shorter their corresponding bond length is. Please feel free to pause the presentation, and take the time to associate the relationships between bond strength and the bond length. In aqueous solutions, covalent bonds are 10 to 100 times stronger than the other attractive forces between atoms, allowing their connections to define the boundaries of one molecule from another. But much of biology depends on the specific binding of different molecules to each other. This binding is mediated by a group of noncovalent attractions, that are individually quite weak, but whose bond energies can sum to create an effective force, between two separate molecules. We will now be meeting the four different non-covalent bonds or forces that make intermolecular interactions optimally possible. These are, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, van der Waals attraction, also known as London forces, and hydrophobic interactions. The first of the non-covalent interactions are ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are most likely to be formed by atoms that have just one or two electrons, in addition to a filled outer shell, or are just one or two electrons short of acquiring a filled outer shell. As animated here, an electron is transferred, for example, from a sodium atom, which has a lone electron in its outermost shell, to the outermost shell of another atom, let's say, chlorine, that is, in turn, lacking an electron. The sodium atom loses an electron, and thus becomes a positively charged sodium ion, or sodium cation. In turn, chlorine gained an electron, and becomes an anion, a chloride ion. Because of their opposite charges, sodium cation and chloride anion are now attracted to each other and are thereby held together by electrostatic forces. Thus, it is worthwhile to know that ionic bonds are also known as electrostatic bonds or interactions. Let's now look at how water molecules affect the strength and stability of ionic bonds. Because of a favorable interaction between water molecules and ions, ionic bonds are greatly weakened by water. Thus many salts, including sodium chloride, are highly soluble in water, dissociating into individual ions, such as sodium cation and chloride anion, each surrounded by a group of water molecules. This contrasts with covalent bonds whose strength is not affected by water in this way. The second non-covalent interaction is the hydrogen bond. What are hydrogen bonds? 
A hydrogen bond, often informally abbreviated as H bond, is a partial intermolecular bonding interaction between a lone pair on an electron rich donor atom, like nitrogen or oxygen, and the antibonding molecular orbital of a bond between hydrogen and a more electronegative atom or group. Or simply stated, this bond represents a special form of polar interaction, in which an electropositive hydrogen atom is partially shared by two electronegative atoms. Unlike a typical electrostatic interaction, this bond is highly directional, being strongest when a straight line can be drawn between all three of the involved atoms. Do water molecules affect hydrogen bonding? Since water molecules are held together by hydrogen bonds themselves, it is expected that water will weaken hydrogen bonds by forming competing hydrogen bond interactions with the involved molecules. It has been found out that hydrogen bonds are only one fourth of its strength in water systems as compared to that of in a vacuum. The third of the non covalent interactions are what is known as the van der Waals attractions, also known as London dispersion forces. Let us look now into how van der Waals attractions come into being. Van der Waals interaction is a distance dependent interaction between atoms or molecules. Unlike ionic or covalent bonds, these attractions do not result from a chemical electronic bond they are comparatively weak and therefore more susceptible to disturbance. The van der Waals force quickly vanishes at longer distances between interacting molecules. To illustrate this further, the electron cloud around any nonpolar atom will fluctuate, producing a flickering dipole. Such dipoles will transiently induce an oppositely polarized flickering dipole in a nearby atom. This interaction generates an attraction between atoms that is very weak. But since many atoms can be simultaneously in contact when two surfaces fit closely, the net result is often significant. Please take note that these so called van der Waals attractions are not weakened by water. The last of the non covalent forces is that of the hydrophobic interactions. The hydrophobic effect is the observed tendency of nonpolar substances to aggregate in an aqueous solution and subsequently excluding water molecules. This force is caused by the pushing of nonpolar surfaces out of the hydrogen bonded water network, where they would physically interfere with the highly favorable interactions among water molecules. The hydrophobic effect is responsible for the separation of a mixture of oil and water into its two components. It is also responsible for effects related to biology, including cell membrane and vesicle formation, protein folding, insertion of membrane proteins into the nonpolar lipid environment, and protein small molecule associations. Hence the hydrophobic effect is essential to life. Because bringing two nonpolar surfaces together reduces their contact with water, the force is a rather nonspecific one. This slide tabulates the effect of water on the strength of the different non-covalent forces, or attractions. Take note which non-covalent bonds are mostly affected by water, and which are not. Also, it is worthwhile to remember that, in contrast to the effect of water on the non-covalent forces, water has absolutely no effect on the strength and stability of covalent bonds. Please feel free to pause the presentation in order to see and understand the effect of water on the different types of bonds. Now, let us move on to the next section of this lecture. We are now going to discuss an absolutely crucial part of life. Water. The source of all life. This concludes the Biochem Serie episode of the lecture on Introduction to Biochemistry and the Biochemistry of the Cell. Feel free to watch the other Biochem Serie episodes of this lecture as linked below in the description.